you here today. I've actually got to uh, Amsterdam and the Netherlands and was down in Utrecht. I got here last Tuesday, so I'm just now almost acclimated to this time zone. I feel like I can be awake this morning because it's not like 3 o'clock my time in the morning anymore. So this is fantastic. It's good for me. And uh, this is my last presentation of this trip. I've been giving a ton of presentations so far throughout uh, the Netherlands and all through different customer meetings. I was at JSpring last week, a Java user group last week. So I'm always excited to talk to large audiences of people who have been in the Java community or maybe you're perhaps in the Kubernetes community. In this case, we're going to talk about kind of how those things come together. So uh, feel free to throw random questions at me in real time, but I'm going to cover a lot of ground really fast. And as this gentleman just said, you know, 20 years ago, we all did some of this stuff. I'm going to talk about 20 years ago just for a moment, just to give some context. So some history lessons here. And this is supposed to be a fun presentation, an entertaining presentation, but we can talk a lot about a lot of different technologies depending on where you want it to go. So your next Java application server. So I actually used this title several years ago inside of Red Hat as part of an ex-JBoss team. I'm a JBosser from 2006 and that was acquired by Red Hat and been in part of Red Hat for all that time. And people were, even in Red Hat, were like, what? Kubernetes and app servers? You cannot compare those two things. Those two, those are not like items. And we, of course, had a little warfare within Red Hat because we have both Kubernetes people and Java application server people. So it ended up being a nice provocative title, which ended up being a fun presentation that I, I, I gave. And so we're going to talk a little bit about this because I think it's a very fun idea. Now, the debate has raged on. Several articles were written based on my title and this presentation and the, st and the stir I caused within Red Hat. Why is Kubernetes the new app server? Written by Raphael, a colleague of mine. And then, of course, some rebuttals written by another colleague of mine to basically say, well, it's not the new application server. Let me tell you what we think it is. So we're going to hear about some of those things in this presentation, okay? Because it is and it is not. And you're going to see why, hopefully, in a very clear way as we get through this. Now, application server defined according to Wikipedia. You notice there are key words there highlighted in red. An application server is a software framework. Software framework, right, for creating web applications. Web applications. We do a lot of web applications at this point in time. It provides an API and clustering, failover, load balancing, and it's focused on developers. So that's a key element. It's focused on developers so they can do what they want to do. So think about those words for a second. API, clustering, developers. That's where I'm going to drill down on in this presentation. Okay, but let me take you back to 1999. Let's do take you back 20 years ago. This is important because I think it helps with context. 1999 was an amazing year. For those of you who are old enough to know what I'm talking about, it was an amazing time to be alive in this world because we had this really amazing movie come out called The Matrix, my favorite movie of all time. If you don't remember it, this scene with uh, Trinity here, is still my favorite scene of an opening of any movie ever made. Right, but when she spun around the room and you realized they invented this new camera technique, it was just amazing, mind-blowing stuff. And these were the biggest songs of 1999. Cher, she still looks the same today. I think she's 108 years old, but she looks amazing, right? And of course, TLC, they've not lasted as well, but you know, amazing songs from back in the day. And then I love, uh, you know, Britney Spears, Whitney Houston. And as a matter of fact, another major event happened the U.S. won the FIFA World Cup. You guys remember that? Does anybody remember that? We dominated the World Cup. Wow, no one remembers. This was a big deal for me and my family. Because it seems no one remembers because we won the Women's World Cup. Now, I have two daughters. I coached my daughter for 14 years in soccer. So we watched this every minute of this event. It was a big deal in my household. But I just make that point. Because I want you to think about your, what your brain just did. Your brain was like, no way Americans are winning a World Cup. Because you think only boys play. Right? Not true. Girls play too. And as a matter of fact, they kick ass. <laughs> I'd take this lady's team on, anybody on the planet. So just keep that in mind, right? Keep that in mind that you have to expand your mind a little bit. Expand your mind. So let's talk about our Java developer 1999. As a matter of fact, I have all these great articles from InfoWorld. You can see Java tug of war. What is Sun going to do for Java? This was a big deal back then. Developers using Java, 51% using Java, right? But C++ and XML, I think that's funny. Developers using XML. It's going to be important later in this presentation. 
Okay? How about Java development tools? $25,000 for Java tools, IDEs. We used to pay for our IDE. Did anybody remember that? It was expensive. It was $1,000, $2,000, $3,000 a developer to get started with an editor and a compiler. That's what it cost back then. As a matter of fact, we had things like WebLogic. WebLogic was amazing. It was kind of expensive, but it was amazing. We had this price point. When you wanted to do Hello World in Java, it cost you nearly half a million dollars. Now, most of you probably aren't old enough to remember this point. It was a big thing back in the day. I used to go out and teach software development. I used to go out and teach web application development with Java and programming in Java. And the commitment that the customer had to make before I would come in and train was substantial. Substantial. And so just bear that in mind, the world has changed so dramatically in the short period of time. The paradigm has shifted because open source has fundamentally disrupted this universe. Okay? And I got a timeout on our browser here. Let's just switch that off and we'll come back to that. And it was this one. There we go. All right. Okay? So it was very expensive, but here's the thing that we got out of this universe, right? We got a full web application stack. We could build web applications for the first time. We didn't build web applications prior to that, at least not really. We had a little bit of ASP, we had a little, bit of, a little bit of CFML, but we really had this Java thing that really pushed us forward in the industry. And it gave us this, these interesting APIs, because when we thought about our application stack, we thought about it from these layers, if you will. There's a web layer, and back in the day, it was just pure HTML. But over time, we added things like you know, jQuery or Angular or React or Vue to it. Right? We added things to that layer. Then, of course, the UI layer might have been generated with something on the server side where we use JSPs, ASPs, CFML, Struts, Spring MVC, Wicket, right? tons of things in that category. The logic layer, of course, was EJB back in the day, Enterprise Java Beans. That is where we made our money as a Java ecosystem. For anyone who was around back then, you knew you got top billable consulting dollars because you knew how to make an EJB. Even back then, the goal was 1K a day. I charge $1,000 a day to help build an EJB for you. It was good money. As, as a Java trainer back in the day, I could charge $2,000 a day for teaching Java classes. It was a beautiful thing. When your application server stack cost half a million, paying the consultant $1,000 or $2,000 a day is no problem. And this is back in 1999 when times were good. This is, of course, before the dot bomb in 2001. So all that was part of that. And so the Java app server defined these APIs that are some of which are still with us to this day. Uh, Java server, Java server pages standard tag library, maybe not so much. I was very excited about that when it first came out. Maybe not so much anymore, but JSP is still with us. Certainly serverless is still with us. JAXRS, which came out much later, is still with us. But JDBC is certainly still with us. So these APIs were very important. And of course, we've now put all these things in a Jakarta EE. We've now used something called MicroProfile. And this is all part of the ecosystem in which we're living. Now, let's show you this for a second. I think it'll be fun to kind of show you just a little bit of stuff. And just because I actually just got this working again yesterday, because I thought, if I'm going to come over here and show you guys this presentation, I want to actually talk to you about Java EE, right? I haven't done any Java in so long, or at least Java EE in so long. I wasn't sure what to, how to do this. I haven't worked with app servers in a long, long time. Let's go back and look at app servers again. It's kind of fun. And so like, here's a little JAXRS application. Pretty straightforward. It is just stuff you put in your war file. Remember the war file, the ear file, right? You know, we had to have those wars, ears, and jars. And in this case, we're not going to spend a lot of time with it here, but let's see here. I have my war file I just built recently. There it is, myapplication.war. Oh, and let me bring up my app server. Okay, so I'm going to bring up my application server here. This is actually a domain-based ser uh, domain, uh, server, meaning it's got a domain controller and multiple nodes in the overall cluster. So it's going to bring those guys online. There's server 1, server 2, and server 3 should come up. Let's go double check it here. We actually have our console. And let's see there. Okay, yeah. And so if I've done everything correctly, and actually let's, let's just go ahead and undeploy this old one. Let's just really delete it. Uh, okay, it's not logged in yet. Not logged in yet. Here we go. Come on. Undeploy. Yes. There we go. Now it's up. And uh, I probably don't have this application up anymore. I just killed it, right? Yeah, there we go. I just killed it. Fantastic. It's a dead one. But if I want to deploy this application, it's just a drag and drop, right? So I can basically say open and grab this jar file. 
Where is it right here? Where'd my browser go? Oh, I got two windows open. Don't need two of those. And we'll go here and here. And let's say I just pick it up, drop it into this column. Come on, drag and drop. The drag and drop thing will become more important later. And let's see, there we go. We're deploying it. And there's its uh, context fruit. And let's go. Come on now, get loaded. And we want to go to stuff. Oh, is it not going to load for me? Not going to load for me? Ah, ha, ha, ha. Let's see here. Look at this. App server's misbehaving. So it is up and running, but not here from the browser standpoint. Let's see here. How about this one? There we go. I must have been looking at the wrong thing. 8080. Not on 8080, but on 8180. Okay, 8280. There we go. And then uh, that's just a different one. But, and there's at 80, so why is my 8080 not resolving here from a browser standpoint? Something weird with the browser. But you can see here's my curl hitting up against those three different instances of the application deployed across those three application servers. You can kind of see here there's one on 8180, 8280, and my 8080 is misbehaving for some reason. <laughs> it's, it is misbehaving. So that's just a curl command looping through it. So something as simple as deploying your war or ear file. That's what we wanted with these application servers. You just take your artifact with your Java APIs included in it and throw it at that application server. That was kind of the point. And the application server could be multi-tenant, meaning it's one development team versus another development team versus another development team. They all deploy their application, drag and drop it, drop it in the right file system, use a CLI, push it, whatever they might use, but to get that into the application server environment. So fairly straightforward stuff, and we've not done much differently than this, right? You can see it's a servlet. Maybe I have a JSP, all right? Or maybe I, uh, I have a JAXRS endpoint or something like that. But it's the standard APIs we know and love within the Java community. Nothing unusual there, all right? We'll come back to that in a second. I'm, I do need to figure out why 8080 blew up on me, but we'll worry about that later. The good news is we have two other endpoints to work with. Our customers are still going to be served. All right, and let's get back over here. Okay, let's talk a little bit more about a couple other things. So in the world we live in now, and as you saw in the presentation earlier with James Ward in this room, there's all these other ways now to build applications and build what's called a fat jar, right? A fat jar meaning I put everything that the application server needs inside that jar file, and so products like Drop Wizard and Vertex kind of gave us this idea. Right, these technologies gave us the idea many years ago. Spring Boot and Micronaut are kind of more uh, latecomers to the game. But the idea now is I can have these additional frameworks, additional runtimes to provide those application server-like functions that I might need. As a matter of fact, there's another one called Quarkus. Quarkus being a Kubernetes native version of the same thing. Right, the same idea like Spring Boot or Drop Wizard or Vertex or Micronaut. But now I can build applications that are meant to be targeted at a Kubernetes environment. Let me just kind of give you a quick demo of that real quick, quick just to kind of make that make sense. So if I come over here to, where's my other browser window here? That one's fine, 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 fine. Okay, yeah, we'll just go here. So if I go to core.corcus.io, let me just put in something random here. All right, dun, 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 go to AMS, all right? And I'm gonna call this, uh, I want this to be rest easy. We'll just add that for now. And let's just hit generate application, download the zip. All right, there's go to AMS there. And if I come over here to my Quarkus tab, I'm gonna basically move uh, downloads, uh, go to AMS, we'll move that here, uh, and zip, go to AMS, okay. Uh, yeah, yes. All right, go to AMS. Dun, 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 dun. There we go. Do I have some? Uh, do I have a different project here based on that name? Let me look at this. I have so much stuff I'm always doing. Let's do this real quick. Let's just make something unique, and we'll basically move stuff around. And here. All right. Let's try this one more time. Make sure I don't have anything overlapping with each other. Not unzip. Unzip. There we go. All right, bring up the Visual Studio Code. Uh, that's my favorite editor at this point in time. But before we get into it, let's just bring up the Quarkus dev environment. I think I do that correctly. Let's see, let's see. Okay, yeah, it's making the network connection here and coming up. 
But the whole idea here is that it's going to give you a default little bit of code, right? So you can come in here and build a little bit of code. And you can see there's something right here called Hello REST Easy Reactive. I might put in go to AMS, uh, AMS, save, and come down over here, say curl, localhost, 8080, hello, and not REST Easy Burr. So there's something else running on this machine. There is something else running. I don't know what, though. <laughs> the um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. let's see here. Let's see here. Let's see here. Let's just do this. We'll get rid of that. We'll get rid of this. I don't even know what I left running on this machine. This is the problem with having so too many things running at one time. And okay, now which one of these guys is the bad guy here? Let's see here. Uh, dun -dun -dun. Looks like that one might be it. Let's just get rid of some stuff here. I should have that other Java process manager. Makes it a little easier to shoot these things in the head when you need to. What else we got here? That might might be related. Oh. Yeah, that was that one. Okay, that was the one I was in. That's good. All right, let's try this again. And localhost 8080, it was hello, good, it's not up yet, which is not up yet, which is good. All right, there we go. So <laughs> the whole point of that was to get you to the, where you could get to a, and I closed everything down, so let's do this, bring up Visual Studio Code, but the whole point is to simply allow you to make changes, right? So if I say burr here, edit, save, and curl, refresh, all right? So that concept of dynamically reloading, right? That was something like you have in the Node.js ecosystem, but we've not really seen in the Java ecosystem. Typically, you build your war, you build your ear, and you drag and drop it, or you throw it into your uh, app server. So this concept of edit, save, refresh, make a change, save, and then curl it again, or I could use the browser, you know, edit, save, refresh, is a very powerful part of the Quarkus environment. But here's the thing that's kind of really exciting. Okay, it has a nice little interactive dev console built right in. You can see it's localhost 8080Q dev there as part of the extension. And that means I can do all kinds of crazy stuff with this. If I basically come in here and say, dun, 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 not that one. All right, dun, dun, if I gotta remember which command sequence, there it is. I can add extensions right to it. So I might wanna add open API. Let's see, open API. I might wanna add Postgres. Let's go with a Postgres. I can add elements to my application, and that still dynamically live reloads. So if I come in here now and build, let's say, a new endpoint, maybe I want to build a new, uh, or I actually want to do something else. I want to add, let's say, another extension. Because if I'm going to connect to a DataBC driver, I want to use Hibernate, and we have another specialized element of that called Hibernate ORM Panache. So let's add that also. But this concept, of being just dynamically interacting and building out the application is part of this new way of building apps, right? This is true of the .NET universe, uh, Python universe, Node.js universe, and now true within the Java universe. I can build my application in a dynamic way by edit, save, refresh. So if I come over here and say, come on now, uh, new file to do, right? I can come in here and say class, extends, uh, panache, entity, right, as an example, and keep adding to my application. So I'm not going to go through with this because we don't have a lot of time, but the whole idea is you just build up your application and you edit, save, refresh. And so in this case, let's go ahead and just remove that for now just so we don't get ourselves in trouble. Because um, here is the entire application built up over here. Oh, this might have been my problem. This other one was running over here. All right. Here's the, other, the complete application built up. And you can kind of see it right here, where it says I have a, let's say, a, a to-do panache entity, which basically means panache is a simplified ORM based on Hibernate. So I now have the concept of the title, the order, the URL, et cetera. And then, of course, I have a to-do resource. A REST endpoint allows you to interact with it, get, put, post, and delete, the standard CRUD operations. And here's the part that's super cool about this. That same application, which you would build with a Maven compile package, Right? Just like you would always build traditional applications, traditional Java applications, that is. That will build my fat jar for me. And if I look at the application.properties, 
Here, you can kind of see it basically connects to the database, to do, to do, and there's an Uber jar. So here's the concept that's important. This application is now going to be deployable into a Kubernetes world. So not just an app server world, right, like you saw earlier with the war file, this fat jar is now deployable to a Kubernetes world. And we're going to talk more about what Kubernetes means in a second, but I just want to show you one thing here. If I don't get an error, oh, Lord, I got test issues. Let's just skip tests for now. Boy, that's a bad idea to show in front of a uh, software engineering audience, isn't it? But I just want to see if I can get the jar file to build, because what I want to do is just simply launch this thing. Let's see if it'll live deploy for me. So come on, come on, come on. Build that. Uh, my top window up here is blocked on something. Let's just close it, because <laughs> it's not happy. But the let's go here. There's building the Uber jar. All right, so here should be the Quarkus jar right there. Open. OK, so there's that guy, uh, target jar file. So if, if that built correctly, same idea as before, but now if I come over here to, let's say, my application again, let's create a new project. All right, let's just call this Burr. And already have a Burr, good grief. Go to AMS. Let's see if I have one of those. No. And then you can do the same thing, but this is Kubernetes in this case. And now I can drag and drop it over here. And we'll just take the defaults. And then if I come back to my topology or hit add, I need to add that database that it's going to connect to. So add the database. And we have Postgres here and instantiate. I gave those things to do, to do, and to do was the user ID, password, and database name. And if all I did that correctly, and who knows if I did or not, because, uh, again, I am just now getting over my sleep deprivation and trying things you know, on the fly. But this has got to load the Postgres database into this cluster, and it's got to load the Quarkus application based on the drag and drop. And now I have an application deployed in this Kubernetes world. So this Kubernetes world, and let me see, this is my Irish-based cluster. So if I come back over here to yeah, this one, this one's connected to Ireland. kubectl, get namespaces. Uh, go to AMS. Helps if you spell it correctly with an L. There we go. There it is. kubectl. Get pods. And we're going to go in. Uh, go to AMS. And there you see, there it is coming along now. Looks like it's coming together. And I'm curious to see, is it, is it working? Uh, da, 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 da. Don't have an SSL certificate. And let me see. This is the to-do application. HTML, all right, uh, love Java, learn Quarkus, be awesome. All right, it seems to be working. We'll double check that, see if it really is working. Bum, 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 bum. And I could go look at logs from the, term, from the terminal standpoint, but let's try this right here. Uh, L, let's see, yep, C, to do, and, and uh, DT tells me the tables. Let's see here. All right, good. So I added the data to the database. So building and deploying applications is similar to the app server world, kind of the point, app server world versus the Kubernetes world. It's just that the Kubernetes world can be more complicated depending on what you want to do. So let's go back into this now and kind of talk more about this. And make sure I don't run completely out of time here. We've got about 15 minutes left. So with Quarkus, you get access to a whole bunch of different APIs just like you do with Spring Boot or Drop Wizard or Vertex or something else. But you can kind of see the Java ecosystem has exploded in terms of APIs. There's more things that have, are outside Java E than inside Java E at this point, is how I like to look at it. Right? Hadoop is not a Java E API, yet Hadoop matters to a whole lot of companies out there using big data and building data marts, data warehouses, and handling big data in, in various forms. So if you look at some of these things, like Kafka is another great example. It's not Java E per se. It's outside of Java E, but part of the Java E ecosystem. So a key element here to understand is while well, Java EE app servers defined our initial world, it does not, it no longer defines the APIs we need, know, and love. We actually have to go well outside the Java EE ecosystem and API space now with things like Kafka, Hadoop, things of that nature. Spring is another great example. So let's talk about clusters for a second. We've got access to a lot of APIs. Let's talk about clusters. In the case of an app server cluster, it handled things like start, stop, restart. Like I just started those application servers here on this 
on the stage here live for you. You can add and remove nodes to your application server. You had something called farm deployment back in the day. At least JBoss had that back in the day, and I just deployed that single application across multiple nodes in my cluster. But these nodes were JVM nodes, right? They're Java virtual machines, and I could throw my ears, throw my wars into them in a dynamic way. I had some form of load balancing and failover, some form of service discovery and logging. That was the point of the application server cluster. They handled our jars, ears, and wars. Handled, we had this thing called a domain controller, something WebLogic came out with fairly early on, and of course, JBoss, we have the same now, adding, adding this concept of a domain controller. But the whole point of the domain controller is yet another process that manages the other processes. You guys see the relationship there? So it's kind of interesting to me because Kubernetes is the same thing. It looks the same in term, if you have to draw a picture. Kubernetes doesn't have JVM-based nodes. It handles operating system-based nodes because a JVM has to run on an operating system anyway, right? It also has this concept of the master node, much like that domain node as before. It's just that it's built of different stuff. So the Kubernetes architecture is with this master set of nodes, a control plane, as some people refer to it, that handles the API, the etcd, the scheduler, the controllers. You throw your applications at it, you get your logs from it. You get some of your observability from it. You get your interaction with the cluster from this layer at the master control plane level. And it, in turn, takes your applications and moves them out across these worker nodes. So almost identical to the way we thought of app servers for the last 20 years. It's just that it does it with a different payload. Instead of a war or ear, it does it with a Linux container image. Same idea, but with a Linux container image. Okay, so there are some unique capabilities. With Java app servers, right, it gave you your APIs, and we talked about APIs already, and it focused on clustering Java apps, while in this case, Kubernetes focuses on clustering Linux containers. It's a little bit different, a little bit different in capability, and you can see, like, we have a web server in the case of our Java application. Well, we don't really have a built-in web server, per se, in the case of a Kubernetes cluster. You can just load Nginx if you want, or Apache, or Tomcat, or Spring Boot, or anything that you might want in terms of a web server, because, it cares about it from a Linux perspective as opposed to a Java JVM perspective. So you can also see that Kubernetes clusters add a lot of other interesting things. Continuous integration through technologies like Tecton. Continuous delivery through technologies like Argo CD. A fleet manager using open cluster management where I can manage a bunch of these at scale. Or maybe I want a serverless engine built right into my Kubernetes cluster. So it's actually gone well beyond the capabilities of a traditional app server with a lot of interesting features. Because here's the key thing to understand about this app server versus cluster idea, or Kubernetes cluster. Kubernetes started out as a relatively monolithic thing also with a very fixed set of capabilities, just like Java E has today. But then it introduces this concept called the custom resource definition, the CRD. And now you can extend a Kubernetes cluster in any way you see fit. You want to declare your own object types, your own application types, your own anything types, and you can extend the API incredibly easily. You want beers, you want pizza, you want Kafka, you want virtual services, you want serverless services, any of those things are possible. So that's where all this comes from. So let's actually show you a little bit more about a Kubernetes cluster to kind of make this point a little bit more interesting maybe. So let me go over here to here. Yeah, 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 this, uh, yeah, let's, okay, no, let's go here. Okay, so I have, uh, so I'm in this go-to namespace over here. That looks good. That looks good. Yeah, let's go here. And the thing to think about, right, is you have this thing called a YAML file. So the, we're going to talk more about the YAML file in a second, but let me see if I can find my YAML file. And where to go, where to go? Here it is. Okay. And here's what it looks like. The YAML file is the deployment descriptor. The deployment descriptor says, okay, what, what do you want to do? What would you like to say to this API, to this etcd database, which is the Kubernetes architecture? And I want to basically deploy my application Spring 1.0. I want one replica of that. Here's the environment variable, some ports, some other information about uh, memory and CPUs. And I'll, I will leave the Livedisk Probe, Readiness Probe out. Yeah, let's just leave that off for now, OK? And I'm going to basically just deploy this to the cluster. So apply-f, uh, my application deployment, and I shoot that thing over, right, using a command line tool. I have a command line tool for the app server also that I could use. But you can see there's my application up and running, up and running. And let's see here. I had a while loop. Let's just see if it's still here. Is that it? No. Dun, 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 dun. Is that one? That's not it. QTTL, get. 
Do I have everything running here? Yeah, that looks okay. Let's see here. All right, dun 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 dun. Maybe it's just taking another second to get connected. Get connected for me. It says I have no pods. I have no pods. Why do I have no pods? CubeCTL, get services. Now we're going to do some back-end debugging here. Yeah, describe service. Uh, service, my application. Let's see. It, it has, it has, where is our IPs? Load ingress, no port endpoints. It does have that one endpoint. Okay. And let's do this. Oh, wide. We'll double check. Yep, that is the endpoint. So why is it not getting through? Why is it not getting through? All right, kubectl, exec, it. Let's just get in there and look real quick. Quick. This is not part of the show. This is me just wondering why it's not behaving like I'd like it to. Let's see here. Dun, 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 dun. Okay. Well, that's what we deployed. Hmm. So that looks good there. Basically, what I did is I exec into that live running pod right into where that JVM is. Let's see. There's PS here. No, there's no PS here. But this is where the Java Merger Machine is running inside that pod. But if I come here now, why is this like, uh, no, it's not going to work for me. So let's do this. Delete service, my application. Let's just tear it down. Okay. And because even the IP address wasn't working. And let's see here. My application. My application. That looks okay. And service. So this is very much like that to-do application deployed earlier, but in this case, I'm doing it all from the true Kubernetes way of doing it, right? Basically, you, you work with it from the kubectl standpoint. And, uh, dun -dun 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 and you have this concept of a service and a deployment. And the service is right there. It said it was linked up earlier. Will this not work for me? Oh, wait, wait, wait. It might help if I say 8080. Ah, there we go. Let's see here. Why was this other one not working correctly then? I must have changed the ports somehow or another when I wasn't paying attention. No. And routes. The hardest thing on to do with the internet is get DNS to resolve, right? There we go. Okay, so let's try this again. Wild, true, do. I don't know why this was acting up earlier, but we, maybe I had the wrong... I, I set up clusters so often that sometimes I can't remember the domain names for them. There we go. All right, all right, we got that going. So the whole point of this was, again, the deployment YAML. And there's this thing called a service YAML. These are the two artifacts that you need to get your application deployed. And here's why this is so powerful. If I say kubectl edit, well, let's do this real quick. Echo cube uh, editor. All right, good. kubectl edit. And my uh, deployment, my application. Here, let's actually change this up a little bit. Let's actually change replicas. So we want three to be highly available, like our application was before on the app server. I'm going to make this thing say uh, hello, right? We're going to leave the image the same and hit close. So I just updated the definition. So here's what's super powerful about this. Let me actually change, take the O wide off so it's a little easier to read. But you can basically pull the YAML back out of the cluster, make a real-time edit to it, and push it back into the cluster without actually changing the underlying file. This is something you only do for uh, the purposes of debugging, if you will, in a development mode, not what something you would do in production. But you can see right now it's basically, fail, you can see it fail over and did a rolling update, and now it has the hello with Java from Spring. But this is a very powerful concept. If I want to come in here now and say, well, I don't really want a Spring-based app, I want a Quarkus-based app, a Quarkus-based app. I have a Quarkus image of the same, edit, save, close, and then you'll see it do the rolling update to the Quarkus-based application. See, it's container creating, it's going through its life cycle, it adds the new container, tears down the old containers, and rolls right over. And it helps if your curl command doesn't freeze on you. There we go. So now it's hello from supersonic Java. Okay, but it can get even more interesting than that. I want to basically come here and say, okay, let's forget about Quarkus. Let's actually make it Python. And actually, I'll go ahead and change this to Namaste, just to see it's different. And uh, close that. 
and now it's going to do the rolling upgrade and go into a Python-based application. There you can see the Python apps now coming in. So the nice thing about this architecture is it doesn't, it's no longer limited to just Java and Spring Boot and Quarkus apps and things like that. It can be Python, Node.js, Go, it doesn't matter what it is. As long as it works correctly for a Linux-based environment, it works well here. Now there are Windows containers on Windows servers, Windows worker nodes also, but that's a little bit different world. I live in a Linux world, I work for Red Hat. But in this Linux world, you can see it's incredibly powerful. So that concept of understanding the cluster is super important. Let's get in here and kind of finish up parts of this presentation, though, before we run out of time. Okay? In the world of microservices, we've lived in this world since 1999, where we broke up application projects to build smaller, composable projects. And then, of course, we got all the way to the right-hand side of this, where the world kind of learned about this thing called microservices not too long ago. As a matter of fact, the cloud was invented in 2006. S3, the first cloud service, and then EC2 after that, came in 2006. It's been a long time. And then, of course, you can see where we had fat jars invented back in 2011, Vertex and Drop Wizard. So you could pack your application server stuff into a fat jar. And then, of course, you can see here in 2012, Netflix gave us these microservice components that did things like service registry, service discovery, circuit breaking, right? Those concepts came out of the Netflix group, which open source Hystrix, Eureka, and Ribbon in 2012. The term microservices shows up on the radar there in 2012. But then the perfect storm of Spring Boot, Docker, Kubernetes was all born, and the term microservices officially defined in 2014. So that all happened at that moment in time. So we've been living in this world since then. As a matter of fact, back in 2015, in order to bring Kubernetes to market, if you go, you, by the way, all the links to the slides are the bit.ly uh, cube app server thing there, right? So that gets you access to the slide deck. You can get access to this link. But we launched 1,000 containers live on stage to kind of show the power of Kubernetes. In that case, it was a Node.js-based application because Java was too slow at the time to launch 1,000 of them in real time. Uh, that's no longer true at Quarkus. Quarkus is now faster than that, faster than Node.js, smaller than Node.js, in which case you can actually launch a Java-based application, 1,000 of them if you wanted to. And so this Kubernetes thing was a big deal, and it's gone crazy since that point in time in 2015. The Kubernetes ecosystem is like the Java ecosystem. It's exploded with capabilities, and there's so many amazing capabilities that are a part of it. As a matter of fact, at this very moment and on this tour I've been doing, I'm actually running servers or clusters, right, clusters of these Kubernetes things over in the North America. Both uh, I had Toronto running. I just took Toronto down, but uh, New York is still up. But I have Bangalore, Singapore, and Sydney because I want to be in Southeast Asia. I've got Amsterdam and Frankfurt. I've got Ireland, and i got London because spinning up these clusters is just like spinning up app servers, and then I can throw my applications at it as I need to. Now, some people will be asking about, about this YAML thing. Well, let's talk another quick history lesson and before we're completely out of time. So back, not, to not 1999, but the year 2000, I wrote a book. And it's a funny thing, because these books are still sitting on my shelf. I took those photos from when I, before I left on this trip and, and put them here in the slide deck. So you can see my little picture down there where it says Burst Sutter. And we have one review at Amazon for this old book. As a matter of fact, we got one three-star review on Silverstream Success Version 2. And it basically says right here that the best part of this book is EJBs because they're so complex. EJBs, because that's what the whole game was back 20 years ago. Uh, so basically EJBs was the pillar of the environment. And chapter 8 was my chapter. So I feel like I'm pretty good there. I contributed to that world. Are we having a flash flood or a hurricane or something? Right? <laughs> so chapter 8 was part of that. So the whole point here is it was all about XML back in the day. And the reason this XML versus YAML debate happens is for some reason Java people still love XML. You have it with your web logic, your web sphere, your JBoss, the entire environment I set up for JBoss earlier. It's all XML set up, as a matter of fact. And we also have our Spring Application Context XML. And sure, we replace some of this with annotations, but there's a problem with annotations in the Java community. Because the point of the XML was we wanted to separate concerns, right? We have the developer who thinks they can throw it over the wall to the operations team, and the operations team has to deal with it. That's why we had XML to begin with, because the XML took the, uh, the configuration of the application and everything you needed for the application, exposed it in something outside your Java files, so ops could figure out what to do with it. And then, of course, we had the wall of confusion that had to come down, and now we build better things together. So I want you to think about the YAML as nothing more than XML of old. It's the way to get your deployment descriptor out of your code. Okay? So this is what that deployment YAML looks like. 
I have a link to it here. You can go check it out. Uh, and then you can go explore it further and deploy it to your application. We talked about the Kubernetes cluster. We talked, we talked about some things with microservices, but there's so much more you can explore in this world. I could spend another three hours talking about Kubernetes, Istio, Knative, Tecton, Argo CD, showing you how to do things like stack rocks and securing your applications across that global space that I have earlier, deploying applications from, you know, from Bangalore, Singapore to Toronto and New York, but we won't have time for all of that. And I realize I'm basically out of time. Let me make sure I hit some other key points here. Uh, some, if you're interested in how do you deal with transactions, the biggest problem in this space is not your JSF, not your JAXRS, not your, you know, your JPA for your uh, Hibernate. Those APIs are kind of available to you with Spring Boot, with Quarkus, things like that. But I do get the question here now and then as well. The app server, the big claim to fame with the app server was two-phase commit distributed transactions. And it was. And I don't, how, how many people here use two-phase commit distributed transactions with their app servers? Okay. So in that case, was it two databases? Two databases? Was it a database and a message broker? Database, message broker, database, database. So the, you guys hopefully know that that's not an easy thing to keep up and running and operationalized. It does not want to live and behave. So one of the things that's happened lately, there's a project called the Bezium that's incredibly powerful, has the outbox pattern. And if you want to bridge the gap between database and, and message broker, this does it for you automatically. And it can also synchronize to another database. And the point of this is, if you, read, if you watch the video here, friends don't let friends do dual writes. It is incredibly hard to operationalize two-phase commit style architectures with two database writes happening concurrently, right? Unless you use something like CockroachDB, which kind of handles that in a different way. But in this case, there's a whole solution to how to manage these multiple transactions or distributed transactions by not using transactions and not doing dual writes. It's a pretty powerful concept. I encourage you to check that out. A uh, couple free ebooks here. Again, the whole slide deck is a Bitly Cube app server and all kinds of free content there if you need it. So free learning resources. And at this point, I am over time. I also have the emergency alert, which basically says something like, I don't know, I can't read Dutch, but uh, I don't know, is there a, like a sandstorm coming? Or I want, it could be more exciting than that, right? It, I get these things all the time at home, too, flash flood warnings. I live in North Carolina. We get hurricanes passing by all the time. Is there a good hurricane coming by? Okay. <laughs> well, at this point, really do go check out the slides at Bitly uh, Cube App Server there. The slide deck is fully open source. There's an amazing bunch of links in there, free eBooks, access to these free tutorials. You can learn all about these things like containers and Kubernetes and Istio and Knative and all this fun stuff. And I encourage you to do so. Because the future is going to be around Kubernetes and being able to use your skill set across any cloud provider on-prem or public that you want. At this point, and, and by the way, that's an important point because with Java app servers, you are a logic person or a WebSphere person or a JBoss person. While we used to say with Java, you could be a WebLogic and JBoss person, it wasn't quite accurate, right? Because you had to relearn all those other XML files that the other people wanted. In this world, the YAML is the YAML is the YAML across all those, uh, all those cloud providers, across all those locations. But uh, thank you so much for your time today.